I met a very nice lady that's going to help us with this documentary. What's your name, dear? Jessica. Jessica, nice to meet you, Jessica. How old are you? I just turned 40. Oh, okay. When was, when was that? January 7th. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. You're welcome. What do you do for your birthday? Got high. Hey, <laughs> you're being honest. Uh, you, that's not the first time I heard that. You know, it is what it is. Where are you from originally? Um, I grew up in Levittown and then I moved to Langhorn and then after I got married moved to Feasterville. So let's talk about, let's go down memory lane, Jess. Tell us about your childhood growing up. Um, like considering like how, like what my situation was, I guess my childhood was pretty good, you know, I was treated okay. Like, um, my, my biological mom was, like, 16 when she got pregnant with me, and my biological father was never in the picture. So, like, I was born and we lived at my biological mother's parents' house. And then when my biological mom um, graduated high school, she wanted to move to California, but my grandparents wouldn't let her take me, so I stayed there. And then when I was like five, we got a phone call that she had killed herself. I'm so sorry to hear that. So my grandparents adopted me, so like if I say my mom and my dad, that's who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I hated my biological mom for a long time until I got deep in depression and realized that even though you have kids, it's easy to want to stop it all, you know? But my grandparents adopted me and like I have a brother and sister that biologically were my aunt and uncle. And like, I mean, we weren't rich, but we weren't like poor, poor, we were like lower income but we lived in a house in a nice neighborhood I lived in Golden Ridge and I always had clothes always had food had Christmas like nice Christmases everything my grandma died when I was 14 and then like that's when my drug use actually like got bad. Like before my my mom died, my grandma, I think I smoked pot like four times. After she died, within like the three months after it, I was smoking pot every day, doing coke, acid, ecstasy, drinking, like, I mean, I, I was drinking when I was younger too, but. But even, like, I mainly just was a pothead. David train. It doesn't stop. Like, except for, like, when you party on the weekends, you know, like, I would save the, the other drugs for, like, special occasions like that. I actually worked a lot. Like, um, I got a newspaper route when I was 11. And I kept that until I graduated high school. And then I was working at least one or two jobs, like 60 hours a week. Until like I stopped working in 2013, I, I worked like crazy. So I, while well, my friends were out partying more often, I would work, which was always good. And I had a nephew that I, help take care of because my uh, sister was a single mom and she was 20 when she had him so I gave up my weekend so she could go out and do that but yeah I, I, man, I'd rather be working right now than be out here okay definitely <laughs> I agree let's talk about what, what what do you do after graduating high school? Did you go to college or anything? No, I was going to join the military, but then I um, 
I wanted to take a year off just to, you know, party and have fun, be a stupid teenager one last time, you know, I was, I graduated high school five months after I turned 17, so I wanted to party a little bit more before I gave everything up. And then, before that year was up, 9-11 happened. And I'll admit I'm a big wimp, but I did not want to get involved with that. Like, I chickened out, and I just, I kept working as, like, I worked as a cook for years and years. But then I went to, um, in 2004, I went to school and became a medical assistant slash phlebotomist. And then got a job in a pediatrician's office. And I worked there for like seven years. And I only stopped working because, well, I have um, back issues. I broke my tailbone when I was 11 and it popped a disc out. And I had surgery in 2011 after I had my son and then managed to pop the disc out above that two months later. And like working was starting to kill me and I was not making very good money and I was working in Willow Grove and the vehicles I like to drive were all V8, usually 5.9 liter, like I was getting 10 miles to the gallon and between tolls, gas and um, everything else, like it was more economical for me to quit my job and be a stay-at-home mom rather than pay for daycare for both kids. So I stopped working to do that. Is that disturbing you? Yeah, it's kind of. It's, yeah, it is in a way, the, right? Like the people pick the most like ridiculous spots to. To handle their business, you know. Mm -hmm. I like it's a whole different world here. That, like, after being here, I, I, there, it, I don't know if there's anything that would surprise me. Like, the stuff I've seen here and hurt. Tell us about it. Um, the worst thing I seen was I was in um, McPherson Square. Needle Park. Mm -hmm. One night, um, just hanging out, you know, and I was with someone, and we were watching this. These two guys, they were walking around looking shady and stuff. And then there was this girl that was like really high. She was like dipping out, walking around, dropping her stuff, you know. So they went up and they were like pretending to like be friendly and help her and stuff. And they, one got on each side, and the one like grabbed bags, and the other takes a needle, st stabs her with it, gave her a hot shot. There was an abandoned car right across the street. They dumped her body in and took her stuff. Like they, like she was so out of it. Like they, they didn't even need to do that. She wouldn't have remembered who they were. She wouldn't even remember that they were there. You know, like sad. Yeah, it's it's horrible what people has, do. Has anything horrible happened ha happened to you since you've been out here? I mean, like compared to what other people have had happen to them, mm -hmm. I don't think it's horrible. But I mean, like I get robbed every other day. What do like, you get I, robbed of? Uh, everything I have. Which, well, no. I always keep my money and my drugs hidden to where that doesn't get stolen. But like any possessions, like my clothes, food, stuff like that. Because like I'll try to like go different places on the train and that train, it's like you get on there and you're like a little baby in the back seat of a car. It just like rocks you to sleep. And every time I fall asleep, my, my stuff gets stolen. Mm -hmm. 
So tell, tell me about your current situation, how you ended up out here in Kensington. A lot of stuff happened in a short period of time. Uh, I was going through a divorce and um, when that started, I was, that's when I had first tried meth, like, I was getting all, like, depressed and stressed out, and it just, my, like, someone came over my friend's house that I was hanging out with and had some, and I tried it, and, of course, I liked it, so I started doing that. Not very often, you know, but, um, after that, like, Oh, yeah, okay, I did start to, <laughs> I, I met some people that, like, also did it, and then I, like, got connected to, um, a dealer, and I ended up becoming a driver for the dealer, so I was getting it for free, and I started doing it more, and then, like, there was a guy that would hang out at our house, and... I started hanging out with him, and we started a date, and uh, I, like, I had been separated from my husband for two years at that point when I started dating, but, um, they even trained. The cops came, that's why they left. Uh, <laughs> but, um, shit. Okay, so yeah, I started dating him, and then he he was driving for my dealer's dealer, and he knew people that would buy um, stuff off of him, and like we were managing between both of us, we were getting at least an eight ball off for free every day. So we started partying a lot, and like. That's when my ex-husband, he started, like, getting extra dickish to me. And, um... Oh, he seen, he seen my, uh... The guy I was dating, he seen him driving my truck. And that's pretty much when all hell broke loose and he... Like, we got in a big fight. He went the next day and got a PFA against me to get me kicked out of the house. Like, I couldn't even, like, see my kids without supervised visitation. You don't need any fucking proof to get a PFA. You can just make up some fucking story about someone and poof, they're fucked. Like, that, that's some bullshit. Like, but, yeah, that, that fucked me up. But, um... Before that happened, the, the way I started doing dope was I had found a bag of dope hidden in my kid's bathroom. My, I, I didn't even know my ex-husband ever even had any way to get it, let alone try it. Like, it, it floored me and like... I didn't even know what it was at first. It was in a little blue bag. It said Panera. And I Googled that shit. And, like, I don't remember if it was Google that helped me. But the guy I dated, he was um, in recovery. He was clean off of dope for nine years. So I took the bag to him. And I'm like, I'm sorry to do this to you. Can, I tell, can you tell me what it is? And he's like, yeah, it is dope. And I'm like, fuck. And I had every intention on just flushing it. But it sat in my car for like two months. And then me and the guy I was seeing got in a huge fight and I knew it would piss him off if I did the dope, so. And then like, every time I went to Wawa in Bristol, a dealer from Trenton would like come up to me and give me their numbers. Like somehow they, they knew I started doing dope, it was the weirdest thing. So like, I dabbled with it. I, did it like three, four times, and then like after being kicked out of my house, like I I did it like maybe once a month after that because I was depressed. Um,
my sister had actually let me move into her house when it happened because normally with a PFA you get like a court hearing in like five days or something but my ex did it right when COVID hit so instead of getting a hearing in five months or five days it took five months and then when we went to court the judge said oh well I'm too backed up on cases we're gonna have to reschedule so like it was bad and um, my sister started getting pissed off because she didn't want drugs in her house and I totally respected that because she had a young son there um, my nephew, my one nephew, is a year older than my son. He, he was like 11 when I was there or something. And so I would do it in my car, you know. And, of course, I would dip out in the car and fall asleep and stay there all night. And she would get pissed. She's like, I got neighbors, you know. And I'm like, y you don't want it done in your house, but you don't want to, like, I'm like, I, I appreciate you letting me live here, but... Like, something's got to go, like, uh, but she she was getting fed up with that, and then I went to rehab, like, she made me go to rehab and shit, and I AMA'd from, like, four of them. I had an excuse for everyone, but she let me come back to the house and everything, but then the guy I was seeing he got kicked out of where he was living so he and he didn't have anywhere to go or anyone to help him so i didn't want him sleeping out on the street so i made myself homeless so he could sleep in my car with me and then like eventually the car blew up oh no i totaled my truck and then i got my ex-husband's Xterra and there was an oil leak and it kept I had kept having to change starter that blew up. I had like three cars blow up on me and actually no one of the cars I just needed a sixty dollar part but I didn't feel like waiting for the person to be able to do the work on it. So I just scrapped the car like an idiot because I wanted the money for drugs. Like it, the stupid shit I've done baffles me, it really does. But, yeah, eventually, like, because in Bristol, and we were in Bristol most of the time when uh, I first left my sister's, and everything's so expensive there. Like, people come here and buy bundles of dope and take it up there and sell it for $10 a bag, sometimes 15 And, uh... So, finally, we eventually just came down here and we started, I think within the first, like, three months, we met some people. We were able to, like, start trapping to make some money. I'll grab a bottle. You okay? Yeah, I was going to, I got a bottle of water somewhere. <laughs> Sorry about that. My right. mouth is so dry. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I can ask you questions if you want. Uh, sure. You can continue yeah. telling your story or I can ask you questions. Oh, uh, you can ask questions. So what, what does a typical day out here look like for you? Um, it depends on the time of the month. I get... Um, I get alimony payments every other week. So, if I have money, I would just, I just buy drugs, get high, walk around, talk to people. Sometimes, like, I'll go to the Serenelli house for food or St. Francis. 
Sometimes I'll go to like the women's center. You can go there, shower, eat, sit down and watch TV. Um, if it's not a time when I have the alimony money, it's a busy day. I, I usually wait until about like, depending on how sick I am and how bad I need money, like eight, nine o'clock. And I'll go hit up stores and boost to get shit to sell. I go to a store, like I usually go to South Philly, um, sometimes Northeast, and then go there, grab shit, come back here, sell it, cop, get drugs. Usually do them on the train ride back to the stores to go boost more, <laughs> like, and it's a vicious cycle with that. But I, I, I can't, I can't do the dating thing, you know, like I, I actually have to like someone to do that with them. So I'd, I'd rather take my chances getting caught boosting. Have you, have you been caught doing that, boosting? A few times. So you've been in jail for that? Or for no. anything else? I've been in jail for, all my charges are drug charges. Gotcha. What's the longest you've ever been in jail? Uh, I was just in jail last year from like May 5th to June 21st or something. So when you got out, you was clean. You didn't use drugs while you was incarcerated, right? Oh man, I, it was, yeah, it was a bad detox. Like they were going to put me on subs, but two days after getting there, the detox was so bad. I got sent to the hospital, and by the time the ambulance got there, I was only breathing three times a minute. Like, I didn't even know, like, I was hallucinating. I didn't know what was going on. I woke up in the hospital, like, four days later. And then I ended up, like, being in the hospital for two weeks because I had ischemic colitis, which, like, hindsight, it's good that I got locked up when I did because that could have killed me if I didn't because when they got me I had $2,500 in my pocket so like I, I was partying and it, it was killing my um, intestines hmm. so what was the first thing you did when you got home what out of jail mm -hmm. well I I went to a recovery house. That's great. They fucked me over. Tell us about it. Um, with being in jail and like the doing the detox and everything I did, I wasn't on any drugs at all. Like I, I wasn't even taking Tylenol or anything. And that was the first time since I was like 11 years old that I did not have any drugs in my system for that long of a period, you know? So I was having trouble sleeping, you know, like you get insomnia when you're used to being on opiates and shit. Um, so I would sleep every other day. And at the recovery house, like, they knew I was only sleeping every other day. I told them that when I first got there and they would come downstairs to smoke a cigarette and see me in the living room watching TV all night. And then they'd wake up and I'd say good night to them at like seven, eight o'clock in the morning every other day. And um, the one night I was like job searching and shit and realized when I went to apply for the job that I didn't have a resume. It was on one of the phones that got stolen from me. And I was getting ready to go to bed and one of the house managers was outside smoking a cigarette. I went out and smoked one with her and was telling her about trying to apply for a job but needing a resume and everything. And then I said goodnight, went inside, went pee, and then went to bed. That was like, probably like 6.30 and I was, Yeah, it was.
was at like 6.30 I went to bed and I wasn't quite completely tired. So I decided to start working on my resume. And I ended up falling asleep sitting up doing my resume and the house manager comes in the room at like 8 o'clock, looks at me and she's like, what are you doing? And that woke me up. I'm like, oh, what? I fell asleep. And she's like, I'm going to need a drug test from you. I'm like, okay, I just took one yesterday and passed. It's not like I've gone anywhere and done anything. That's fine. But I just peed an hour ago. You, you seen me. So I need to drink some juice and it'll take like a minute. And I was trying to drink juice she let me, there, there was like two house managers or something, like one assistant, one, but they were both like up my butt, and uh, I was drinking the juice, they gave me like 10 minutes to drink juice, and they're like, alright, that's enough, you can go, and they had me sit on the toilet trying to pee, and I'm like, I really need to drink more, I'm sorry, I'm trying, like, I was trying, and... 20 minutes later, they're like, okay, you had enough time. This is going to be your refusal, and you automatically fail your test. We're going to call your PO. And I knew you'd fail a drug test. you go right to jail. So I'm like, fuck that, and I took off. And you've been down here since? Understood. How was your first drug experience like? Uh, what do you mean? Yeah, like the first, first time, time you I did got it, high? Yeah, how did it feel? Well, like any like first what about drug fentanyl? first time? Yeah, fentanyl. How did it make oh, you feel? Fentanyl. Oh uh, well, I I did fentanyl like not to get high the first time I did it with with my back issues and um 2018 I got in a car accident and popped three discs out in my neck and they're actually popped like this way and it's pressing against my spinal cord mm. and it pinching nerves like it causes me to get migraines and everything so I was I was using fent fentanyl patches for the everyday pain I was in so like that was it just made me It made me like normal to where I could get up and get my kids dressed, get them to school, clean the house, pick the kids up from school, take them to karate, take them to soccer, football, you know. So like I wasn't doing it to get high until I came here. And I actually like I didn't even start doing dope really really bad until uh, my best friend died. That's when, like, I went off the rails. What happened to your best friend? Um, he was in the mountains at his dad's house celebrating his birthday and his son's birthday because they were a day apart. His son was born the day after him. Mm -hmm. Well, not the day after him, but... Um, so they were up there and his dad has quads so they were riding around the neighborhood on quads and shit and something happened and he like the way it sounds like no one's seen him he was ahead of the person on the other quad mm -hmm. but it was him and his um 10 year old niece on the back and when the person from the other quad got to him, the niece was sitting in the middle of the road crying. He was laying in the road, not moving, and the quad was like off the shoulder down the ditch. So like, it, it sounds like he either was um, going to turn too fast and fishtailed, or a car came, or like something, and the quad was going to roll, and he was more worried about getting his niece off without her getting hurt, and I think the quad rolled on him because he had like massive internal bleeding and didn't make it. Oh, so sorry to hear that. All right, so we're going to speed things up so we can be done, all right? When you look at yourself in the mirror now, what do you see? I try not to. <laughs> I try to... Um, yeah, 
I don't okay. even know. I hear that. How long have you been on drugs now? Like, the, the two months after jail was the longest clean time I ever had, but I'm 40, so 29 years. Okay. Do you, do you think you reach your rock bottom? Oh, that happened a while ago. And the only, the only reason I'm still using is because I'm homeless. Like I'm not going to be living out here on the streets, not getting high. You know, if I had somewhere to live, I would go to a methadone clinic and get clean and shit. But like without having a place to live, I can't get a job. Like I can't do anything without having somewhere to stay. What about the shelters? What's your they're take? All, they're all like full. Hmm. They're, they're either full or they have like ridiculous rules to where like you got to be in at like 8 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, that's not good. And I've heard like a lot of them, you got to watch out, you'll get robbed there. And like, like I, I want to get into Beacon House, but yeah. that's, that's hard to get into and a lot of people want to get in there but I'm, I'm doing a study through the mobile unit outside of prevention point and my um, case manager she said that there's this other study where they're doing um, uh, they're studying micro induction for Suboxone and she heard you get paid like four grand to do it and it's only a two week process. Mm -hmm. So I'm most, so I'm thinking about doing that because that right there would be money for an apartment. Yeah. An apartment, a car, and then I, I'd, I'd be golden for a job. And right, right. What advice would you give to people who are starting to use drugs newly? Stop, it's not worth it. And what about those who are off drugs, but they have the cravings and they want to go back to it? Don't if run to the meeting or whatever it takes. That's it. It's yeah, it's definitely not worth it. Right, right. What does life mean to you? Pain. Yeah, pain, right? How many children do you have? Two. My daughter turned 15 in August. My son will be 13 in March. And who are they staying with? My ex-husband. Do you, do you think about what you're doing to them? Yeah. How, how does that make you feel? Like an asshole. Are you going to try to fight to get back on track once you get this money that you plan on getting? Yeah. Or keep on trying to other shelters and stuff? It, yeah, definitely um, because I want to get everything taken care of. I have legal issues that I'm also like right, right. running from, you know, yeah. like... Uh, I'm well, you dreading get... having to turn myself in, but I want to have the, my own place, mm. a job, okay. and everything, and be sober. That way they see I'm doing good for myself, mm -hmm. because every charge I have is drug charges. It's like eight drug charges. But, like, I'm also supposed to be on probation, and I'm absconding, and that's usually, like, six months minimum or something so I'm hoping if I have everything like in order they won't really make me do any time or they'll let me do that like weekend crap mm -hmm. you know okay well eventually you gotta face your fear one day instead of running from it all the time right yeah but like that that's what I like your plans right yeah I wanna I wanna be in a good place and right. show them I'm not understood what all have you lost due to your addiction? Everything.
Okay, we, let's get off topic and we're done, okay? What are some things you love most about yourself? I don't think I love anything about myself. Uh, I, I love that I have awesome children. What's your zodiac sign? Capricorn. Yo, shout out to the Cap. Show your sign some love. What are some of your favorite foods? Uh, I'm like a steak and potatoes type of person. Okay, sounds good. And French toast. Okay, what are some of your, do you have a favorite band or artist you listen to? Rammstein and Till Lindemann. Oh, okay. When you were a little girl, what do you want to become when you grow up? Um, I think at one point I wanted to be a brain surgeon. And when I got like a little older, a marine biologist. Awesome. What are your short term goals now? Uh, you just get the place to live, get a job, and stay clean. Get my shit together so I can see my kids. I uh, I have visitation rights to like I have more physical custody time than my ex-husband. I just I can't get to them, you know, and I won't go near them if I'm using, right. you know, Absolutely. like want them to see me like that, and I don't want to bring that near them. Got you. So, if your family or your friends see this video, what message would you like to send to them? Nothing, because anything I would say would not be nice and... Understood. If you had three wishes, what would your three wishes be? <sighs> I wish I could go back in time and start life over at like age four. <laughs> Shit, I'd even be happy with like age seven. Um, I would wish maybe never meeting certain people and never fucking never picking up a damn needle. Smart, smart. That's right. You're you're on on track, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, I wouldn't change nothing. I'm like, you wouldn't undo mistakes you made, bad choices that ruin your life. You know, life is ruined by drugs. So this is the last question to take, this is the last one to take us home, Jess. There are a lot of people in this world who judge people who are struggling with addiction. What's your message for the world? Try like to not judge people because you don't know what people have been through. Especially now with COVID, I've talked to people out here. There's people that had multi-million dollar businesses that are out here on the streets because COVID messed it up. You know, I've met a guy that's out here because in the middle of the night, his house caught fire and like he couldn't get to his kids and his wife in time and they all died in the house fire. Like anyone who's out here mm -hmm. anyone who's out here doing this crap just had to have had something horrible happen to them where they have some type of mental illness and addiction itself is a mental illness you know like I never understood that until recently, but it, it, we just need to, I keep saying we need to do what Portugal did, legalize all the drugs, that way you can tax it, use all the tax money, and put it into the healthcare system for mental health help. In Portugal, it like dropped the crime rate, dropped the drug rate. It boosted the economy and employment status. Like, it it did wonders, you know? Like, mental health is the top thing. But, yeah, like, 
don't judge someone unless you know what their story is, what they're going through. Excellent. AML family, I want to tell the lovely Jessica, thank you so much for being courageous and opening up. I know it takes a lot to do stuff like this and you are brave and your story is going to resonate with some people and you are making a difference. So I want you to just never stop fighting, okay? Never stop fighting for you. Then you can fight for everyone else. So AML family, we're clocking now. Remember, don't be bitter, be better. Until next time, Jessica, Mal, we out there. Peace out. You are so heartless, and you don't care. And I don't even know what I've been fighting for. You got me hoping, and you don't care. And I don't even know what I've been fighting for. Every time I fall in a and I can't fight it, I can't fight it You wreck my mind, I'm losing my sleep And you know that it's all that I need So don't leave me alone